this time, uh, it gives me indeed a great pleasure to have the privilege of... At this time, uh, it gives me indeed a great pleasure to have the privilege of introducing one of the newest congressmen we have in the United States Congress, who is uh, Congressman John Melcher, and he was ele elected to represent Eastern Montana in the United States House last fall. After a spirited campaign on farm issues, he wasted no time in speaking out for the farmers when he got to Washington, and his views won him a place on the House Agriculture Committee. Congressman Melcher is a graduate of the Iowa State University, where he received a degree in veterinary medicine in 1950. He started his veterinary practice in Forsyth, Montana the same year and has been involved in Montana rural community and farm activities over the state. A real pleasure to introduce you, Congressman Melcher. Thank you, President Ellers, officers, directors, and delegates, friends. One of agriculture's great old timers who is known to many of you here used to tell a story of a pioneer doctor out in western Kansas, which the story seems appropriate to the present farm program situation. The doctor was much beloved in his community, but the folks became concerned about the number of cases of fits which were occurring in the community as diagnosed by the old doctor. And finally, a committee of three went to the doctor and approached him as diplomatically as they could. They praised him for bringing them and their children into the world and for curing their ailments throughout the years. They explained that there was a bit of community concern about the number of people having fits. The old doctor smiled, told them not to worry. He explained that he earned his degree in medicine on an early day in a medical school in just one year. Then he explained that in the intervening years, a lot of newfangled diseases had been invented. But he said, you folks kept me so busy I didn't have time to read all the journals or go to the conventions and keep up on all of them. And consequently, when I run onto one of these newfangled ailments that I cannot diagnose, I just throw them into the fits, and I'm hell on fits. <laughs> well, as a veterinarian who cannot talk with his patients, I have some sympathy for the old doctor. Vets are sometimes confronted with animal behavior that doesn't give a very clear basis for diagnosis. And unhappily, we do not have a formula for throwing them into the fits so we can treat the fits. As a freshman congressman, and I only got there just a few months ago after a special election in June of this year, as a freshman congressman, I sometimes suspect that the economic doctors are trying to cure the ills of the agricultural industries with the Fitz technique. They don't know exactly why the blood, the dollars that make the agricultural economy healthy, they don't know why this does not flow more abundantly and richly. They do not want to prescribe massive transfusion from the Treasury. So they propose cures, which at least give those of us on the Agriculture Committee the fits when we, when we go to try to consider them. Dr. Clifford Harden, the Secretary of Agriculture, Dr. Don Farberg, his economic consultant, and several other economic doctors and interns have been meeting with the House Agriculture Committee each week for some time, every Monday night. We met last night trying to develop a diagnosis and a prescription for the ills of wheat, feed grain, oil seeds, cotton, milk. At one point, it looked as if they might prescribe a massive land retirement program and try to save money by allowing cattle to graze on 30 to 35 million acres of retired cropland. That was back when choice steers 
We're bringing $34 and $35 per hundred weight in May and June. With the price of choice steers now back at the $28 to $29 level, that cure has been all but abandoned. Without endorsing it, the doctors came up with a set-aside program, a new way of getting acreage diverted from crops and surplus. It looks to me like it is a great deal less precise than the diversion techniques we already have. Under it, under the set-aside program, a farmer or rancher would set aside out of his farm acres, his conservation base acres, plus 30%, 50%, or even 100% of his domestic wheat allotment, the portion that goes for U.S. food purposes. Then he would be free to plant whatever he pleases on all the rest of his farming acres, wheat, feed, flax, or any other crop. In the case of wheat, he would get a reduced loan on all his production set at 80 to 95% of the previous three-year average market price. This is to keep the loan below the world, uh, below the market price. It would be just a loan, not a price supporting loan. Dr. Hardin and his advisors suggest a loan of 10 cents per bushel under the present national average of a dollar and a quarter. That means county loan rates under a dollar a bushel in some Montana counties. Up to now, the proposals by Hardin and the administration are not claimed publicly. And under this fatherless, motherless, unsponsored idea, the Secretary of Agriculture would set the value of domestic use wheat certificates on, quote, general criteria. They would repeal the requirement that they be tied to 100% of parity. The secretary would take into consideration farm income levels, feed values, incentives necessary to keep crops in balance, and some other factors. But not necessarily that factor that we all know, which has to do with increasing costs of production. One of these unnamed factors would very likely be how much the Bureau of the budget wanted to cut the agricultural budget. In a computer projection of program results, Dr. Hardin's economic doctors have fed into the computer a suggestion that we have a dollar fifteen per bushel loans and a dollar fifteen certificate payments on wheat. An assured return of only two dollars and thirty cents per bushel on the domestic use part of our wheat crop instead of the $2.77 this year or the $2.85 expected to be parity level in 1971. This projection indicated that the return from wheat to the farmers and ranchers of the nation would drop $414 million on the low projection and $79 million even on their high projection with $1.15 loans and $1.70 domestic certificate payments. Now there's no way of getting around that either on the new or on the old math method. It is less wheat income for the wheat producers of this country. The only hope they had for the wheat patient was a world wheat shortage which would send market prices well above the loan level. The only hope of salvation would be very short supplies of wheat in countries which have dollars to spend for grains. The Secretary of Agriculture testified early in the department's presentation that the president's new family welfare program, including welfare programs for the poorest farmers and retraining for those able to be retrained for jobs in urban areas, would save small farmers. Before the secretary presented his cure of putting 400,000 farmers and ranchers on welfare, the United States Chamber of Commerce had suggested the same solution. And I reject that solution, and I hope you do too. I am concerned about the small family farmer and those described in one presidential study as a people left behind. But I'm also concerned about some mighty fine farm operators with farms and ranches plenty big to support a family well who can't survive 
with declining prices and rising costs. As a partner in a veterinary clinic in Forsyth, Montana, for nearly 20 years, I know some excellent farmers and ranchers with sizable layouts who just cannot pay high interest, high taxes, high fuel costs, and high machinery costs, and the grocery bills, and the, finally, the vet bill too, and that has always been quite important to me. Now the, the farm closures we are facing, and there are plenty of farm sales this fall, these closures are not just of the 400,000 whom the Chamber of Commerce and Mr. Hardin want to put on welfare or move out of agriculture. They are also among good, well-equipped operators. There will be more and more of them if wheat income is cut another 15% and other farm prices decline accordingly. Good farmers will continue to sink to the level of the 400,000 earmarked for welfare. Instead of a farm ladder, we have a farm toboggan slide in the making. If we allow it to be built, and you and I and your neighbors are going to have to stop it, and we're the only ones that can. Just how long are we going to let this sort of attrition continue? How long are we going to let the Chamber of Commerce dictate a farm policy that continuously, continuously reduces farm operators to the flat-busted group for whom they see no future but a new type of welfare or retraining to move into the already overcrowded cities? Food costs consumers 16% of their disposable income today. Farmers get less than 40% of what the consumer spends. And when foreign food products are taken out, they get less than 5%. Farmers get less than 5% of disposable income. Farmers could have 100% of parity prices for less than 6.5% of the nation's disposable income. Just another one and a half percent increase would give us parity. But are they getting parity? Are farmers getting them? Well, you tell me. We know farm prices are less than they were 20 years ago. We are expected to pay 1969 costs with 1949 prices or less, and it does not work. And it is time, it is time you guys right here, and you ladies, you gals, shout loud enough about this so they can hear it down in Washington. It isn't good enough that you and I know it. They have to know it down there. You all have to be a little louder than that now. They will never get there. Now, I'm a, a horse, a cow, a sheep, a pig, a cat, and a cow doctor, not an economic doctor. My degree from Iowa State University is in veterinary medicine, but my judgment of agriculture's illness is acute economic anemia. It needs a transfusion, a transfusion of blood rich in what we call cartwheels out in Montana, good old hard dollars, which are the red blood cells that give strength and vigor to the patient. The cartwheels or red corpuscles are missing in the marketplace. We need some white corpuscles too, and that's more credit to help repair the damage and, and the wounds of the past. But some of those hard dollar red cells from current crop production must finally replace the white corpuscles if the patient is ever going to be healthy again. And my own prescription for the ills of agriculture right now is the Coalition Farm Bill. I first introduced it in the House on September 15. It proposes a real blood transfusion for wheat, 65 cents per bushel export certificates on the 40 to 45 percent of the crop that is shipped abroad. And that would amount to 375 to 400 million dollars 
for the wheat producer's bloodstream an increase of 15% in wheat income instead of a cut. There is other medicine in that bill. There is a consumer protection reserve, the emergency reserve of wheat, feed, grain, soybeans, and cotton, which would be set aside in surplus periods to be held until an emergency arises and the prices go over parity. The Wool Act is extended without any termination date. There is a class one base plan for dairymen. There is provision that farmers themselves can vote in marketing orders on their commodities without any veto by those who buy and process farm commodities. The cotton and rice programs are extended for southern producers. It is not a cure-all, but the coalition farm bill will help to keep the agricultural patient alive. It will help to keep the farmers on the farm until a real cure can take its effect. The hope for passing of the coalition bill is not that a freshman congressman from Montana introduced it and that it has 40 co-sponsors now in the House, or that Senator George McGovern and many co-sponsors have put it in on the Senate side. The real hope is in the coalition of farm groups, the biggest farm coalition in recent history, which is backing and working to get the 218 votes in the House and the 51 votes in the Senate necessary to get it passed. That coalition includes the Farmers Union, and I'm sure the national, that national president Tony Deschamps, President Clyde Jarvis of Montana, Ben Radcliffe of South Dakota, and Ed Smith of North Dakota, Ed Christensen here in Minnesota, and Gilbert Rohde over in Wisconsin, along with your GTA and Central Exchange leadership, Barney Molusky and Tom Steichen, are going to give it all the push they can. It is a must prescription to keep the patient breathing and his heart beating while we go about a real cure. The long-term cure for farm mills, in my opinion, is in feeding people. We must increase consumption on food and assure a demand that will give, that will bring good prices and the dollar corpuscles necessary in the economic bloodstream of farming and ranching. Some of this increased consumption will come from upgrading the diets of Americans by converting more feed into meat. Some of it will come from feeding the undernourished people here in the United States, and that's 20 to 29 million of them through an adequate and not a stingy food stamp program. They should and need to eat twice as much more meat as all those imports we are complaining about. We have authorized increasing this year's food stamp program from 280 million to 610 million. And that is about 20% of what we must finally do if all Americans get minimum diets. We really ought to authorize the Co Commodity Credit Corporation or a new nutrition corporation to provide what is, whatever is necessary to assure every American a minimum adequate diet. And we will, we will do that when we really intend for all of the hungry to be fed. The increased demand for farm products would, of course, mean more farm income and a healthier economy. Some of the red corpuscles our agricultural patient needs can be supplied by aggressive use of the Food for Peace program. It is now being used at only about one half of its authorized funding level, 1.4 billion as compared to an authorization of three billion per year. Our missions abroad, in my judgment, are not encouraging the use of this food aid program to stimulate economic development in the poor nations as they could and should. Somehow, word has gotten out from the budget agencies that we must invest our foreign aid in guns instead of bread. There are hungry people here in the United States and in the world who can eat and need to eat all we can produce, and that's the way we will finally find the right cure for our domestic agricultural ills. I also believe that massive doses of food for the needy will do a great deal to build peace in this world and solve a lot of problems outside of agriculture. Food will solve a lot more world problems than will nuclear arms. Thank you. 
I'm told, I'm told by a lot of the old pros down in Washington that it is all but hopeless to save farming and ranching as we know it. I didn't run for Congress last June to go to Washington to attend a wake for family farmers and ranchers. I did not go to the Capitol to march in the funeral procession of American agriculture. I wanted to go to Washington to see if I couldn't help cure the patient, to help revive our most basic industry, to give hope to the people on the land, to return opportunity in agriculture for our young people. And that's why I went, and I'm going to try to stay there long enough to see that job done. What, what I'm telling the city folks down there is this. Don't dry up the milk cow just because part of last week's milk soured. If a family has a milk, Holstein milk cow that gives several gallons of milk per day and they, and they are, they can't use it all of it, rather than dry up Elsie, the better procedure is to find neighbors that can use some milk and butter and cheese. And before Uncle Sam dries up the family farm, we need to remember the abundant production of Elsie is not to be turned and on and off quickly and started again when we run out of milk next week. Family farms adapt more easily to shifts in demand, most easily. Of all the farm, of all the farm sizes, family farms adapt much more easily than, than the larger ones to the demand question. But they are pretty much like the milk cow. When they are dried up, it takes another gestation cycle to bring them back into production. Now, Elsie knows the bull when she sees him, and on occasion, she accepts him. And we also know the bull when we see him, and our trouble is that we have accepted too much bull for far too long, and it is time now. <laughs> It's time now to tell the people with the bull we are tired of the free ride and we're not going to be dried up anymore. <laughs> with your help and much more enlisted in the 22 Organization Coalition, I think we can pass enlightened farm programs. I believe that we can restore the sort of farming and ranching, the sort of rural American which has made and continues to make the United States of America the great nation that it is. We are the one nation in the world with the resources to assure all of our citizens a good life and also share substance and know-how among the nations of the world who seek a peaceful and a constructive world. Farmers and ranchers have power. I saw that power displayed recently in the cooperative tax fight. I was one of the 30 members of the House who voted against the tax reform bill. It had glaring defects in it, like complete repeal of the investment tax credit and the cooperative dividends provision. That was, really wasn't a revenue matter. It didn't have any place in the bill. It was a sneak provision that had never had hearings or been mentioned until it came to the floor of the House under a rule which prevented offering an amendment to strike it. But after the farmers went to work, the Senate Finance Committee killed this provision by a 12 to 3 vote. And as one committee man in the Senate committee said, we clobbered them. We've still got to hold it out of the bill in conference, but I'm sure that a fighting farm coalition will get that done. And I have faith that a fighting farmer rancher coalition will get a farm bill through this Congress that will keep agriculture and our rural communities alive to fight another day. We must not just for our welfare, we must for the welfare of sons and daughters, for our grandchildren, we must for our nation, and in no small degree, 
for all the peoples of the world who depend upon us. And I leave you today, I'll be returning to Washington this evening, with an old Irish, an old Irish blessing. May the road be straight before you. May the wind be always at your back. May the rains fall gentle upon your fields and make them green. And until we meet again, may the good Lord hold you in the palm of his hand. Thank you very much.